where he does translation for a couple of different programs. Um, they uh, sort of reconnected and started visiting a little bit back and forth and emailing. And uh, both sets of children grew up together, all right, and knew each other very, very well. They were like family. And so uh, with the full support of their grown adult kids, uh, they were married. Now, Mexico has some different rules about marriage than the United States does. And that is, uh, Mexico does not recognize validity to uh, marriage in church. And so you have to have a civil ceremony there in order for it to be a legal marriage. And so uh, Gil was civilly married this past week, and then there will be a church wedding this coming week. And so uh, when Gil returns home, he will be bringing a wife with him. And so we'll be excited about meeting her. So we can be praying for this and be excited for Gil as well. Uh, Gil is 70, case I have people ask me this, so all of you won't ask me after you. Gil, I believe, is 76 years old. And so some people say, hey, you know, that, how come you didn't wait longer? And I say, when you're that age, you don't have that much longer to wait. <laughs> uh, they have known each other very, very well, and we are excited for this. So I wanted to share that with you. Uh, there was a family watching a movie on the life of Jesus Christ on television. Their six-year-old daughter was deeply moved as the film realistically portrayed the crucifixion and the death of Jesus Christ. Tears ran down that little girl's face as she looked at the toll that the crucifixion took on Jesus Christ. She continued to cry as they carried him to a tomb and as they closed the door with the big stone. She then bounced up on the arm of the chair, of her father's chair, and she had great anticipation. And she looked at her dad and said, Daddy, now comes the good part. <laughs> Today, folks, now comes the good part. Last Sunday, as we looked at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we got to admit it was a pretty dismal Sunday. We looked at the toll that your sin and my sin took on the life of Jesus Christ. We look at how Jesus Christ became the dumping ground of all the sin of all time. From Adam's first sin, he who knew no sin, but sin, the very first sin, dumped on Jesus. All the way to this present moment, every sin that you and I have already committed. For those who will come after us, all the sins they committed fell upon Jesus Christ. He was not only the sin bearer, as you'll recall last week, we looked at the scripture that said, He who knew no sin became sin, that you and I might become the righteousness of God. The great exchange. Our sinfulness for His perfection. Our despicable behavior for His righteousness. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. God the Father looked at His Son, who became sin. And he turned his back on him as we discovered our sins made God one of us. It's a sad story. But that is the depth and the length of what God would go to so that he can spend time with you and me. And what we're going to look at today is what validated his crucifixion. If it was not for chapter 27 in his story, there would be no story at all. Paul tells us that without the resurrection, the life and the death of Jesus Christ would have no value to it. You see, this is the whole story. We discovered the very first week of this story that when God created man and God created woman, the heart passion of God is that he wanted to spend time with us. And the scripture told us that every day he would come down in the cool of the evening and he would hang out with Adam and Eve. And even after they sinned, God showed up as he always had. Why? Because sin did not change the passion of the heart of God. He still wanted to spend time with us. And he did what was necessary by dying on the cross, paying the debt of our sin so that he could now come, live within your heart, live with him on him and spend time with us. What I'd like to do is a little bit of what I did last week and before I really jump into the heart of, of what we want to talk about in chapter 27 today, I want to just hit a couple of things in the chapter that we just won't have time to spend much time on, but I just want to kind of point out a couple of high 
highlight things that maybe you can go back and investigate a little more closely. 381 is where chapter 27 begins in the story. So if you'd like to turn there, that would be terrific. If you're new with us today and you don't know what this story thing is all about, uh, it is a an abridged Bible put in chronological order, set up like a history book or a biography that gives us the continuous flow in consecutive order of these wonderful, significant events in history. The good, the bad, and the ugly, and how it all ties together in the story of God as he links his life with our lives. And that is what the storybook is all about. It was done under the direction of Randy Frazee and Max Licato, two pastors out of the state of Texas, and uh, two wonderful, wonderful gentlemen who I think have done a great service for the kingdom of God to help people get a perspective of the Bible that is difficult to get in the way our regular Bibles are set up. This book does not replace this one, all right? This is just a wonderful aid as we come to greater understanding of everything that is in this book. And so when we get to the main text, I'll give you the scripture passage that you can look up in your regular Bible that we'll be reading from in the story. Put on page 381. There's a brief little part there about a fellow by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. We saw that on the big screen as well. Joseph was a, an influential man. He was a wealthy man. And he was a secret believer in Jesus Christ. It was dangerous to be a bold believer. The Holy Spirit had not yet come to indwell the life of the men and women who were Christians yet. So they did not have that, that, that courage that God could bring by his dwelling presence. And so Joseph was a secret believer, much like Nicodemus was. And the two of them paired up together to go to Pilate. And after Jesus was uh, was crucified and he was killed on the cross, they went to, to Pilate and said, can we, can we have the body of Jesus? We would like to give him a proper burial. And so Joseph gave to Jesus his own burial plot. It was a nice tomb. We don't think about things being nice, but this was a rich man, all right? This was the best they had to offer in that particular period of time. And so Joseph said, hey, I love this man. He's been changing my life. And I want to honor him. I don't believe that Joseph understood that Jesus wasn't going to be this long. Somebody once told the story about uh, asking Joseph Arabella, why in the world would you give this costly, beautiful, hand-dug tomb away? Why would you give it to somebody else? You bought it for your own use. And they said, Joseph smiled and said, why not? He only needs it for the weekend. <laughs> I'm not sure Joseph knew that on the front end. I think he thought he was losing his place forever. But it turned out just to be a temporary rental. Just a vacation home for a couple of days for Jesus to use. Uh, if you flip over another page or two, page 383, uh, there's a small little paragraph just before the break there. And it says, so the women hurried away from the tomb, praying yet filled with joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. I want you to notice something. Their joy was stronger than their fear. Is the joy of knowing Christ stronger than the fear you have of sharing your life story about him and with others? I have a little western room. Shelly's decorated up one of our bedrooms that since we are almost an empty nest house, uh, one of the bedrooms is converted to a western room. It's kind of a reading room for us, but it's where she's put some of the stuff that are my little treasures that she can't stand <laughs> the rest of the house. So, <laughs> so uh, she's made up this little room, and there's some John Wayne metal prints that, that I kind of am fond of. And one of them is John Wayne saying, Courage is not about not being afraid. Courage is realizing that you are afraid, but doing the right thing anyway. And I would say that's these ladies that day. Their joy discovering that Jesus was alive. Their joy was greater than their fear. Uh, you flip over to the next page, 384, and you know, right towards the top of the page where it says now, right after the break, fourth paragraph down. Uh, that, that next two and a half pages is a story about the encounter of the risen Jesus not the ascended Jesus. Sometimes we'll go into a difference of what all that means. But for today, the risen Jesus Christ, and he appears on the road to Emmaus, and a couple of his disciples are walking along the road, and they're talking about the dilemma of the crucifixion of Jesus and the rumors that his body is missing. And Jesus
Jesus just sort of uh, pops out of nowhere, and he joins the conversation with him. And I want you to notice the bottom line on page 3A4. And it says, they went to the two murders this morning, but didn't find his body. They came out and told us they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. They're telling Jesus the story about his missing body. And they are saying the folks who went to the tomb didn't see Jesus. And they're telling Jesus about the folks who didn't see Jesus. And they don't know it's Jesus. They're telling that nobody saw Jesus. <laughs> Ever sound like you? Yeah. Ever sound like us? Page 385, first paragraph, last sentence. The beginning with Moses and all the prophets. He, Jesus, the one they had not recognized, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And look at page 386, first sentence on top of the page bringing us to a conclusion on the road to a main story. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. You see, he taught them the scriptures, and while they were listening to his teaching, they didn't understand what he was saying. Does that ever happen to you on Sunday morning? You don't understand what's being preached? Whether it's Robert or Gene or myself. Have you ever asked God to open your mind? And I don't mean ask God, hey, God, you know what? I don't want to read your word. God, I don't have time to do uh, any study of words. So could you just kind of pop over my head and pour in all the truth so that I can know you better? So with your diligent study and your intent listening to the scriptures, if you ever say, God, I want to understand the truth. Uh, down before the last break on page 386, there's a story in there that's told about Jesus showing up uh, to Thomas. Jesus had shown himself and revealed himself to others the disciples, and they went back and told all the rest. And Thomas said, until I see and until I touch the scars in his hands, I am not going to believe. And so Jesus shows up, and he shows Thomas, well, why did Jesus do that? Because that's who Jesus is. He wants to spend time with us, and so he came to do with Thomas what Thomas needed. Now Thomas never ever touched him. We have no records, but I don't need to touch that scene. And I love this line that Jesus told him. Because you have seen me, you will believe. Blessed are those who have not seen me, and yet have believed. Do you realize that's a blessing on you and on me today? Jesus said, blessed are those who are going to come that will not have the privilege of seeing me during this brief period of time that as a resurrected Savior, I'm going to walk the earth and talk to many of you. Blessed are they who will believe and not see me. And that is a blessing on us. And then the last page of chapter 388, Jesus meets some of the disciples on the bank of a river. They've been out fishing, not doing very good. And Jesus is up there cooking fish. I, that's always been a mystery to me. They're out fishing. We have no record that Jesus did any fishing. Uh, their boat was empty, and yet Jesus' skillet was full. And uh, I guess that's why he's Jesus, huh? And at the end of that story, Scripture tells us Jesus did many other things as well. And if every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that could be written. And I would say to you, we almost don't have room for all the books that have written about this book. But he said there's even more than Jesus did. And for reasons you and I do not fathom, God chose not to record them to keep them for us for the day. But, next paragraph. But these things that are written are written that you may believe the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life through His name. The purpose of God has not changed from creation to resurrection. The purpose is that you and I may have everlasting life and walk in relationship with God Himself. That first Easter Sunday morning was so good. That was a phenomenal. We touched on big chunks of it already. But that first Easter Sunday was so good because the days right before it had been so bad. Good Friday commemorates the crucifixion, the darkness, and the death of our sin and the life of Jesus Christ. 
Easter Sunday morning, three days later, it commemorates the resurrection and everything that is wonderful and good and grand about what Jesus did for us. But the Saturday in between, what does it mean? What does it symbolize? And I suggest to you today that day in between crucifixion and resurrection commemorates On that Saturday, it seems that Christ was totally defeated in his body. And he lay utterly dead in a rock tomb. The spear had sliced his heart. His tongue had gone silent. Death was absolute. No one was betting on the resurrection. In the story, we are going to discover today how we can get unstuck from Saturday's mood and move into Sunday's bright light. Turn, if you will, to page 382 in the story. If you have a regular Bible, it's found in Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 through 64. Page 382, or the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 through 64. And this is how it's rendered in the story. The next day, the one after preparation day, the Sabbath, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate, sir, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples might come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you can. <laughs> as secure as there's almost a tinge of Pilate's voice that says, do the best you can, but I don't think it's going to be good enough. And so they did. They went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. When it says a guard, we're not talking about one guard. We're talking about a battalion. All right? This, this tomb was well protected. And when the Sabbath was over, Mary Bagley, Mary the mother of James, Shalom, bought spices so that they might go and anoint the body of Jesus Christ. Two key things we're going to look at this morning. First of all, Saturday was a no hope, no courage day. Have you ever had days like that? Days that started, continued, and ended with a sense of no hope and no courage. I had a few days like that this week. Monday, my wife asked me to look at a baseboard. A couple of stains at the bottom. She said, does that look like that's been wet? I said, no, babe, I don't think so. I pro probably just the, the spray guy for insects and probably left the stain. Doesn't it smell musty in this room? <laughs> no, babe, it didn't smell musty. <laughs> So that afternoon, she invited Vince Little from our church to come over and pull the baseboard off and just, just take a look because he wasn't trusting my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as he pulled the baseboard off, um, water was found standing. And it uh, not only was damp, but as you got to the corner, uh, it was exceedingly wet with sandy water uh, in between the walls. And as... Um, Vince and I began to tear away just little by little sheet rock, and that little by little got up to almost six feet up the wall. We found where there was a pinhole and a copper pipe spraying water all over the place. We have no idea how many days it has been doing this. And so my no hope, no courage day started because I had to say, I, I was wrong, you were right. <laughs> Termites? <laughs> and I looked at it and 
down to a Friday and Saturday. There are some Saturday seasons in the lower story that are so full of sorrow. The despair is so deep and the canyon walls are so steep that not even an upper story angel can get our attention. I would call these, if you will, Desperation Saturdays, and they can happen any day of the week. The day before the resurrection is a no-courage day. The movement of Christ seemed totally defeated. Jesus' body was moldering in a grave. The disciples hid in every corner of Jerusalem for fear that there was a cross that had their name on it. You see, they were living in the lower story perspective. They thought what had happened to Jesus might happen to them. That is why Jesus stood in the fire with a young baby. No big burly guards around, just a young girl cooking a meal. She says, and didn't I see you with Jesus? No, not me. The cross with his name on it was what he feared. No curse. Saturday was a no hope day. It could have been a day of hope considering all the times that Jesus promised big things are going to happen on the third day. Saturday, no courage, no hope, and a no plan day. These followers of Jesus didn't plan on seeing the death defeater on Sunday morning. They didn't plan to talk to him. They planned to embalm him. The women were going to the tomb that day to put perfume and spices on him to keep the stench and the stink of death away a little bit longer. They weren't thinking about life. They were thinking about preserving death. While Jesus' opponents were celebrating his death, the disciples were hiding in fear. The women intended to care for Jesus' body. Page 382 in the story. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away? They had no intention of finding an open tomb or an empty tomb. Their biggest concern was who's going to help us with the task at hand. If you and I are not careful, we can be just like these women and just like these disciples, we can get easily stuck in Saturday living. Living with a Saturday state of mind. No hope, no courage, no plans, believing that death is the final end and the final answer. Desperation, Saturday. Everyone dies. We know it. But we try to avoid the reality of it. We brush our teeth every day. Some of you do. <laughs> you go to the dentist. We eat good foods. We pay our bills. We raise our kids. Guess what? Romeo and Juliet still dies. JFK is assassinated. Princess Diana killed in a wreck. Life, Saturday, disposition. Saturday, desperation. Max Cato tells the story of his brother. For reasons I don't know, Max calls him D. All right? D. D was an outgoing, friend making, joy bringing kind of guy. D was the personal ambassador for a shy younger brother named Max. In his teen years, D met a bootlegger at alcohol track team. For the next 40 years, Max's brother D drank away his health, his friends, his job, and his money. At age 54, D made a serious decision to try AA. As a result of that, his life and his marriage stabilized. But the years of alcohol and smoking three packs a day left D in a fragile health condition. He began experiencing chest pain. He was rushed to the hospital, the emergency room, by an ambulance. And by the time his wife Donna arrived with one of their sons, D was already gone. Wife and son went into that room the now dead body of their husband and their father. And one of his hands was resting on his thigh with his fingers curled in that international sign that means I love you. Max knows why he did that. Max firmly believes that his brother had moved out of Saturday thinking into Sunday thinking. Out of desperation into hope, out of fear into courage, by God's grace, D moved from Saturday, death, to Sunday, everlasting life. Can you move that quickly from Saturday to Sunday? Second thing I want us to notice out of this 
particular chapter. It's not just Desperation Saturdays. Now, they can happen any day of the week. But I want us to know this. Hope in few Sundays. Resurrection Day. Eternal love. Eternal life. Eternal hope. That is the infusion of Sunday morning into our world. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb of Jesus stuck in a Saturday state of mind. Very confused. Very troubled. She saw him and she thought he was a gardener. Can you tell me where they've taken you? <laughs> she didn't know she was saying you. Can you tell me where they've placed Jesus? I'll go get it and I'll take care of him. Mary had buried more than a friend. She had buried the only person who had ever helped her. She had been afflicted by seven demons. In the Bible, the number seven typically represents completeness. So apparently Mary was completely afflicted. Paranoia, depression, epilepsy, we don't know it all. But she was emotionally disabled and people avoided her. But not Jesus not. Because the purpose of God is to be found with us. Regardless of our condition, regardless of our circumstances, this is an upper story God who is not motivated or moved by lower story problems or situations. Jesus befriended her. In him, Mary found a friend and a future. And now her friend and future are buried in a tomb. And her world is stuck on Saturday even though it's Sunday morning. And as a result, she initially missed the miracle of the empty tomb. Seeing an empty tomb did not lift her spirits. She missed the message of talking angels. That did not open up her mind. So Jesus, what does he do? He makes a personal appearance to Mary Magdalene. Why does he do that? Because he's Jesus. He's full of mercy, and he wants to spend time with you and me. Jesus, alive from the dead, meets with Mary Magdalene, who's alone in her despair. And what does he do? Call her by name. Mary. Mary. When Mary first saw him, she thought wrongly that he was the gardener. Have, have you ever thought wrongly about Jesus Christ? Have you ever missed his presence in your circumstance, in your situation? Have you ever talked to him as if he... Was not Jesus? Do you think he's someone else? Jesus could have given Mary Magdalene the stars. Because the scripture says he owned them all. Jesus could have entrusted her with power. Because the scripture says all power and authority have been given to Jesus Christ. Jesus could have given her the ability to do great and incredible works. For Jesus had just defeated death and hell and the grave. But when it comes moment of honoring his devoted servant. Folks, I don't know if you've ever noticed this before. I'm going to go back and do a little study. From the time of his arrest until after his resurrection, Mary Magdalene is the only one who calls him Lord. Where have you placed my Lord? Thomas said, my Lord and my God, but only after he saw it. Mary's the one that in a Saturday mood, she still called him Lord. What did Jesus do for her? He gave Mary himself. Here I am, Mary. I'm yours. Call him my name. You heard Jesus call your name. He does. He is. Why did Jesus personally appear to Mary? I suggest to you because that's just the type of Jesus he is. He's full of mercy, full of compassion. Are you here this morning in a season of darkness? This could be a very good season for you. During these Saturdays, we assume that God has ticked off at us. We assume that he's crossed his arms, he's stepped away, and he's saying, Why don't those people wake up? I sent the miracles, I sent the messengers, and they don't listen. I give up. This story reveals to us God never gives up. He keeps coming and coming and coming again. He pursues us. Why? Because he wants to spend time with us. His message to us is this. Saturday will always be followed by Sunday. Weeping may take place at night, but joy comes in the morning. So be patient and wait and watch. And unless we find an answer for the death question, we will always be stuck in Saturday blues. If you're stuck in Saturday... I want you to know God's not. He's flipped the calendar for the next day. In the coffee break room of heaven, if you look on the calendar, it says Sunday, 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 Sunday.
Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. It is always the day of hope and promise in heaven. His invitation to you and me on our Saturday, move on. Move on. Don't stay stuck. Move from the last day of death to the first day of life. Saturday, the body was still in the tomb. That's the last day that even Satan and his imps would think that death was going to win. Move from the last day of death, Saturday, to the joy and the victory of Sunday morning, the first day of life. And the choice is on. In a book called Six Hours on Friday, Mercado tells the story of a missionary in Brazil who discovered the tribe of Indians in a remote part of the jungle. They lived near a large river, and the tribe was in need of medical attention. A contagious disease was ravaging the population. People were dying every day. A hospital was not too terribly far away, but it was across the river. And the Indians could not cross because they believed the river was inhabited by evil spirits, and the end of the water would mean certain death. The missionary explained how he had crossed the river, and he was unarmed. I've done it many times, he said, but they were not impressed. He then took him to the bank of the river and he placed his hand in the water and they still wouldn't go in. He walked into the water up to his waist and out again. He would splash water in his face, but it didn't matter. They were afraid to enter the river. Finally, the missionary dove into the river, looked beneath the surface, swam all the way to the other side, came up and walked out on the other side, threw his fist in triumph in the air, and everybody on the side cheered and then they leapt into the water and swam across.
the disciples are hiding and Peter's denying that he knows the Lord. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Jesus is standing before the high priest of Israel, Simon, the lamb before the slaughter. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. And Jesus is beaten and mocked and spit upon. But, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday. And those Roman soldiers are flogging my Lord with a leather scourge with bits of bone and glass and metal. And they're tearing his flesh. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. And the Son of Man stands firm as they press a crown of thorns on his brow. It's Friday. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. And you see him walking to Calvary and the blood dripping from his body. You see the cross crashing down on his back as he stumbles beneath the load. But folks, that was Friday. And Sunday's coming. It's Friday. And you see those Roman soldiers driving the nails in his hands and in his feet. And you hear my Jesus cry, Father, Forgive them. They know not what they're doing. It's Friday. The Sunday's coming. It's Friday. And Jesus is hanging on a cross and he's bloody and he's dying. The Sunday's coming. It's Friday. And the sky grows dark and the earth begins to tremble. And he who knew no sin became sin. And the holy God who will not abide with sin pours out his wrath upon the perfect sacrificial lamb, his very own son. And the son cries out, My God! Why have you forsaken me? That was Friday, but Sunday. Yeah. You guys might get one again. <laughs> Cam Polo told the Baptist group of white folks one day, he said, I'm gonna have to de you to get you into this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they need to get a wiggle. It's Friday. At that moment of Jesus' death, the veil of the temple to separate sinful man from a holy God was torn from the top to bottom. And why was it torn? Because Sunday is coming. Amen. It's Friday and Jesus is hanging on the cross and heaven is weeping and hell is partying. But that's because it's only Friday. And what don't they know? Sunday is coming. And on that horrible day 2,000 years ago, Jesus the Christ, the Lord of glory, the only begotten Son of God, the only perfect man died on the cross of Calvary. Satan thought he had won the victory. Surely he had destroyed the Son of God. Finally, he had disproved the prophecies of God that he had uttered in the garden. And the one who was going to crush his head had now been destroyed. But that was Friday. And now it's Sunday. And just about dawn on the first day of the week, there was a great quake of the earth. But that wasn't the only thing that was shaken. Because folks, now it is Sunday. And the angel of the Lord is coming down out of heaven. And he's rolling stones away from the door of a tomb. It is Sunday. And the angel of the Lord is sitting on that stone. And the guards that were posted at the tomb to keep the body from disappearing, they are now shaking in their boots. Why? Because it ain't Friday anymore, folks. Sunday has arrived. And the lamb was silent before the slaughter is now resurrected as a lion who came from the tribe of Judah. He is not here, the angel said, for he is risen. Why? Because Sunday has finally arrived. It's Sunday, and the crucified and resurrected Christ has defeated death, sin, hell, the grave. God's grace is now poured out on any man, woman, boy, or girl who will seek the truth of the crucified Lamb of Calvary. Grace freely given to all who will believe that Jesus died on the cross, buried, and three days later rose again, all because it's Sunday. Amen. Folks, there's a bunch of people in the church today who believe they can't alter or change their community. But folks, the good news is it's only Friday. Amen. And what's happening?
baby was born in Bethlehem. We win not because a man, Jesus Christ, was crucified on the cross. Paul said, if all we did was live and get crucified, we would be of all people most miserable. What validates his birth, what validates his death, is his resurrection. Amen. It was Friday. Amen. The Sunday came. Have you let Sunday come in your world? What is Satan trying to do to you to keep you living in perpetual Saturday? Why don't you let him make a difference on this Sunday? Father, your word is more powerful than any two edged sword. Your word is more powerful than any personality or delivery. It is your word that brings to us the reality that one day he died, three days later you raised him from the dead. Father, we must come to a point in our own life that we must realize that he is dead. Dead in our trespasses and sins, dead in our fear and our problems. But Father, we do not have to stay dead. We can be born again. By faith in this one who said, I will lay down my life and three days later I will take it up with you. The antidote to death is life. Sunday morning is a picture that life, not death, comes to life. There are some who are here today that are discouraged with far bigger problems than broken pipes and wet walls and the height of the tent. There are folks here, Father, who are carrying world-sized problems. But Father, we do not see the size of the problem. You've already evaluated the size of the answer. And the answer is the risen Son of God. Big enough for every problem we have in the world. I pray that we'll be surrendered to the next few years. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Guys, have a great day.